Uh, today is June 22nd, 2020. It's always nice to do a date and time check to make sure that we were all in the right place at the at the right time. Uh, I appreciate seeing some names and, and faces that I haven't seen in some time. I hope uh, everyone is safe and, and being productive and, and getting through this the best that you can. Uh, we have a slightly different agenda uh, today than our typical uh, committee meeting, and I think it's going to uh, give us a chance to share some information and uh, to have a, a, a bit more conversation versus some of the uh, typical PowerPoint uh, driven exercises that we have. So um, with that, I will call the meeting to order. Again, my name is Jason Keller. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, I sit in a group called Community Development and Policy Studies that don't know me thinking about access to credit capital and opportunity for uh, the greater Chicagoland uh, region. Um, I'm going to turn the uh, floor back over to Austin, who's going to do uh, a, 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 some sort of attendance check and, and, and possibly a few introductions. So, Austin, to you. Thank you. So, I seem to have a, several names uh, just looking at the um, people who are listed, but I'm not sure I have everyone on the phone, so I'm just going to run through these pretty quickly of the committee members. I have Jason Keller, Kevin Kramer, Lance Pressel, Marie Castaldi, uh, Kevin Considine, Doug Pryor, Lisa Castillo-Richmond, Michael Horsting, Brian Gay, and Henry Pierce. Any other committee members that I missed? Uh, Kelly O'Brien. Hi, Kelly. How are you? Uh, good morning. Doing well, thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Kathleen Nelson is on. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Any other committee members? Great. Okay. So then I think on to quick announcements. Um, as you know, as Jason mentioned, we are we have gone virtual. We are trying to find the best way to engage our committees uh, through the, the new era that is uh, online engagement, I think, is something that many of our organizations are trying to figure out how to do best as we sort of proceed through public processes. Uh, I think to get these back, um, you know that these regional tables are more important than ever and yet also more difficult than ever to really achieve and, and do well because we are sort of in the middle of two critical and interconnected events, one of course being the global pandemic and then the economic effects of, of trying to contain it, as well as the renewed calls for racial equity and racial justice since the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and, and too many others. So I think it's at, at this point in time with the work that CMAP is doing and scoping uh, for itself, economic development is going to be at the heart of, of both of those two events. And we want to make sure that we are engaging our partners to think about what we need to be doing as an agency and where we can be helpful uh, to the region as a whole. So with that, I really appreciate the opportunities I've had to check in recently with, with most of you. And, and hopefully, I think there's a couple more meetings on the books in the next couple of weeks to sort of check in and see where your organization is and the work that you're doing and how it has evolved. To that end, we are asking for some assistance today, as Jason mentioned. Our goal for this meeting is to sort of be a good uh, gut check for everyone to, to be able to redraw some of those connections that we all rely on day to day but haven't been able to maintain very well during the during the shutdown and so we are asking that you keep your cameras on so that we can see your lovely faces uh, note reactions to to some of the things being said begin to draw connections for uh, discussion afterwards if there are things that we can uh, do together we do have a couple of new members who will be joining the committee. Uh, first is, as you heard earlier, Kathleen Nelson from Cushman Wakefield. Uh, she is bringing a great deal of uh, private sector and, and developer perspective to the committee that we have been wanting to bring in more of. Another is Jennifer Tamman, who will also be providing some of that private sector uh, perspective. And then we have a, a new face from the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, who. We did not have a chance to talk before the meeting, but hopefully will uh, be able to join. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to let you know that we will be recording today's meeting, mostly for our own record keeping, because uh, it can be quite exhausting to try to take minutes of these, uh, but just wanted to let you know before uh, we proceeded. So unless there are any questions, I think we can move on to the next uh, agenda item. Great, thank you, Austin. Um, so with that, uh, we did meet on January 27th of 2020. Um, 
hopefully everyone has a, had a chance to review those minutes. Uh, do I, I have a motion on the table to approve those minutes? So moved, De Laurentiis. Second, Kelly O'Brien. Great, thank you. Uh, with those two motions uh, and a second, I do I have a motion to approve? All those approving, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Hearing no nays, the minutes from the January 27, 2020 uh, meeting are approved. All right, um, so with that, um, again, I'll just echo Austin's comments for this next section. Um, we have blocked off uh, 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 some time to really be candid with each other. And yes, while we are recording this, um, you're gonna see some questions pop up on the screen of, of the kind of things that, that we're talking to. So um, I, Austin's gonna go ahead and, and lead us through this, but, but I, from what I understand, we're trying to accomplish here uh, we're make we're trying to make this as much of a dialogue as as we possibly can in the time allotted. So uh, I encourage you each of you to be candid and and, and talk about possibly some success stories, um, but also areas of need. Uh, something that if your organization is in need of, we are a uh, a large group, but also a, a a vast group in the sense that we have expertise in different geographies, different areas of focus uh, to deal with the two. Uh, the, the global pandemic and what's happening with the civil unrest uh, in, in our community. Um, so with that, I will turn the floor back over to Austin to walk us through the questions. Sure. We don't have a, a clear path to this. I think we want to try to keep as much interaction and conversation as possible. So I think if you have the agenda pulled up uh, next to, to your screen, we want to sort of go roughly in alphabetical order and hear quick updates from the members. I don't think it, we want to be too prescriptive about that. So if you don't feel the need to answer each of these questions or any of them, uh, that's perfectly fine. But we do want to, to try to recreate the kind of environment we would have if we could meet in person uh, and be able to sort of raise questions with each other and draw connections as appropriate. So if we have a, a volunteer from some earlier in the alphabet, that would be uh, really handy. Otherwise, we're going to have to cold call someone like a, a middle school teacher. Why don't we start with uh, Marie from the Chicago Jobs Council. Can I put you on the spot? Uh, sure, that's fine. Um, Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone. I was having some sound issues earlier, but so I didn't get to chime in. But this is Mari Castaldi from the Chicago Jobs Council. I'm the director of policy and advocacy there. Um, folks may know the Jobs Council. We are a member-based organization, and our members are around 70 community-based organizations that provide job training and other workforce development services across Illinois. Um, so, as you can imagine. Um, an organization who works on access to employment for folks who face a lot of barriers to employment. This is a really challenging time for a lot of our member organizations um, and the communities that they work with. I think um, there are a lot of needs and concerns at this time. Obviously, chief among them is that the labor market is in really bad shape, particularly for folks um, in, um, you know, there's sort of two different issues. A lot of folks are losing their jobs and those folks who do still have jobs that are in essential jobs are, um, you know, facing potentially really dangerous conditions and heightened health risks on the job. Um, many of the organizations who serve job seekers are themselves adjusting to moving their own services remotely while still being sort of held accountable to outcome measures prescribed by funding streams like the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which is really challenging to figure out how to sort of like meet their placement numbers at a time when the labor market is sort of upended. Um, and I think there's also a big concern about the fact that, you know, immediately prior to the pandemic sort of rocking the economy, um, we were in a sort of historically tight labor market and making some gains towards efforts to integrate folks who had a lot of barriers into the labor market, people coming out of prisons and jails and returning to communities. Um, you know, there was a lot of effort being paid to 
marginalized workers and getting them into family sustaining jobs through workforce development. And there's a concern now that with the situation being totally re reversed and sort of unpredictable, that some of those efforts will be sort of um, deprioritized and it will sort of go towards the folks who are the closest to success sort of getting the resources um, through workforce development and that in order to counter that really intentional efforts will be required. Um, so I think right now one of the things that we're a role that we're playing is really trying to help make sure that organizations on the ground that are assisting individual job seekers have access to the best possible sort of labor market information and understanding of what's happening and what to expect and and sort of where to focus their efforts. That's obviously very much a moving target and is really sort of hard to pull apart at this time. Um, but it's something that looking at this committee and some of the resources here that I have a special ear out for as we try to sort of build capacity in the workforce field to respond to these unprecedented challenges. So that's what's going on at the Jobs Council. Thank you, Mari. Any questions, reactions? No? Okay. Uh, Lisa, do you have any, any updates? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Castillo from the Partnership for College Completion. We're an organization that is focused on college persistence and completion in racial and socioeconomic equity in college degree completion in the state of Illinois. So our work falls into three primary areas. Um, we look at data and research on trends in college-going persistence and completion patterns across the state and equity within those patterns. We also look at state policy work um, and do uh, some advocacy around primarily affordability, developmental education reform, and transfer student equity and success. And then our third area of work is um, in partnership with two-year and four-year colleges and universities across the state uh, to help them deploy institutional practices and policies that achieve more equity in their persistence and degree completion outcomes. Uh, we do do a lot of in-person meetings. Um, you know, a lot of our work is very relationship-based. Um, it's uh, you know in Springfield, it's uh, at colleges and universities. We do a lot of convening, we do a lot of teaching and learning and sharing and um, you know a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. So uh, we've been really busy over the past several months doing kind of crisis emergency response as things have been changing on the ground for colleges and universities in terms of you know students going home, obviously remote teaching, um, you know, virtual learning. Uh, so we've been working on adapting our practices, um, basically putting all of our programming online for the foreseeable future, um, for the 2020-2021 academic year. We're planning to be virtual, although we're we're hoping to not be virtual in the second half of the academic year, but we are making plans um, um, to support institutions in that way. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, awareness raising about how we, um, you know, a lot of a lot of campaigns around, you know, how closely linked uh, economic conditions and the economy are linked to college going patterns in general uh, across the state, obviously, and across the country. Uh, we've been working with the Illinois Board of Higher Ed on a state of course campaign. Uh, we will be launching um, an online hub about college going in the state of Illinois during COVID um, with the idea being that there's a lot of information out there, that things are changing very quickly, and how do we make sure that things that high school counselors are thinking about, things that parents have questions about, uh, information as colleges and universities make decisions or, you know, possibly the need to switch some of those um, plans that they have for the fall uh, as, as things evolve over the course of the summer and then actually during the fall and spring semesters. Uh, so we've been trying to create central repositories of information, convene people virtually to talk about things. 
um, highlight some of the practices that other college and university systems and state systems across the country are doing and how Illinois can take advantage of that knowledge and information um, and bring it to bear here. I think a lot of the things that we're very concerned about are um, you know, the, the impact on college enrollment this fall, um, both students coming straight from high school and those that uh, would be returning to college uh, to continue on their post-secondary pathway. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different plans. I think it depends a lot on the, the college and university sector, what kind of institution it is. I think there's been a lot of pressure on four-year institutions in particular to try to bring back at least some of their students uh, in person because there's a lot of concern about uh, a more significant decline in enrollment if they're not able to have some of those courses in person on campus. Uh, a lot of the community colleges in the state have already made the decision to be mostly virtual, uh, except some of those um, highly technical or applied courses being given in small groups on campus if uh, state policy will allow for that, depending on what the situation looks like um, in the fall when, when college and university courses begin again, mostly in August. Um, so we're, we're trying to uh, keep uh, our finger on the pulse and make sure that information is disseminated very widely. Uh, but we know this is going to be an extremely difficult time, obviously, for students and families uh, that will impact their college plans, uh, but also for the institutions themselves as higher education has become more and more dependent on tuition revenue. Uh, even minor shifts in enrollment um, can have very significant impacts on the, the institutional well-being. Um, so trying to, uh, you know, support institutions um, and uh, through state funding and how any stimulus from the federal government is distributed to institutions and looking at that through an equity lens, making sure our institutions that serve uh, disproportionately larger numbers of um, low-income students in our state, um, African-American students, Latinx students, making sure that those institutions are receiving adequate funding um, to continue on and, and do their work. And do you, do you have a sort of updated timeline of where the equity and attainment initiative is going and where those plans currently sit? Yeah, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways we think, uh, you know, the the current context of, um, you know, all of the things happening, both, you know, related to social justice, um, related to equity, we think that puts an even finer point on the work that the 28 institutions in our Illinois Equity and Attainment Initiative are doing, um, and uh, just. To, to remind those of you who may, may or may not have heard my presentation in the past, so we have a group of 28 colleges and universities, two and four public and private nonprofit, that have pledged to eliminate their racial and socioeconomic disparities in degree completion in the next um, five years, essentially. And so part of that work has been um, planning for um, and creating these institutional equity plans that are connected to their institution strategic plan and that go into effect this fall. So they're 2020 to 2025 institutional equity plans. And these institutions are really doubling down on saying, you know, despite all of the challenges happening right now um, in our institutions, despite the concern about tuition revenue and the state budget and how that will impact um, institutional operating budgets, you know, we're staying the course because this equity work could not be more important. Um, so those plans will actually go public sometime this summer, uh, probably in July. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for this one? Okay. Uh, Kevin, how's that? Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Kevin Considon. I'm the president and CEO of Lake County Partners. We are the nonprofit economic development corporation for Lake County, the, the northern suburbs. Um, 
frankly, as uh, as you know, all of us. So our organization has been able to adjust reasonably well uh, to operating in the in the work from home environment. Although if you ask some of my colleagues with little little kids at home, I think they'd give you a different answer. Um, but uh, we're uh, as we've kind of seen, you know, the things that we need to to focus on change. Um, we've been trying to balance sort of the short term needs around communication um, to businesses both large and small of uh, sort of whether it's what's going on with the virus, how to operate in that environment, uh, connecting to business assistance through the various sort of elements and stages of that business assistance um, and, and really building that, uh, that communication um, and balancing sort of the longer term efforts around still the traditional business retention and attraction which would seem that uh, you'd think that all of that had sort of ground to a halt through this, but the reality is it hasn't. Some projects in specifically have, but a lot of them are actually still moving forward, which is really encouraging um, that that kind of stuff uh, is still happening. Um, and how do we, uh, we measure that? We are also about to launch, so we're working with uh, uh, Lake County government to help distribute their the, the small business portion of their CARES Act dollars. So the Lake County received $122 million for the CARES Act. We've allocated in sort of phase one, uh, 10 million of that to go to small business relief. So we will launch, I believe next Monday, uh, a small business grant program for businesses under two and a half million dollars and giving a preference for those who have not received federal assistance to date. Um, everyone sort of uh, believes that that 10 million isn't necessarily going to be enough. So if we can stand up this program quickly and make it effective, a definition still to be determined um, that you know we can we can put more money uh, in it as well. The goal is to get um, particularly small businesses uh, just to, to help them reopen and operate in the new environment and frankly kind of stay alive. Uh, through at, at least sort of uh, through into the fall uh, when hopefully demand can pick up whether you're a restaurant or a you know auto shop um, and and that small business is sort of a new audience for us so key in that is um, how do we reach uh, particularly minority owned businesses um, and as we've kind of built layers of a communication plan, reaching audiences that that aren't haven't been our natural constituency over the last handful of years, whether that's working through the chambers of commerce, uh, certainly our municipalities uh, have been longtime partners, but also you know how do we engage the more informally say the the pastor network in uh, communities like North Chicago and Waukegan, um, which uh, has been great. It's getting it's gotten us talking to to some. Uh, new folks in the last handful of weeks. It'd be a lot easier if we could do that face-to-face, -face, but we're all uh, uh, you know, doing that. So we're, we're excited to, to get this launched next week. And then frankly, asking some larger questions from a strategic standpoint. Um, what, are the, what are the questions that we ought to be asking? And is this an opportunity to maybe to, to take a deeper look at our strategic plan and kind of say, all right, What's changed as a result of this environment? What new opportunities are there um, that uh, that we can take a, a fresh look at? Um, and are there are the things we're doing today that we should that we should stop doing, uh, as well as what are the what are the new things? And frankly, kind of building on some of the things that that Lisa just said, um, you know, as we take sort of a longer uh, view, what would it look like if college going and and college completion were economic development uh, strategic pillars. Um, I don't have the answer to what that would look like, but frankly, those aren't typical questions that are asked in an economic development strategic plan. Um, but I think it'd be a really uh, interesting avenue uh, for us to investigate. Great, thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Peter Kartos. I turn on the mic. Um, again, I apologize. I sent a chat out. Um, I received a notice this morning that the meeting was canceled. So I apologize for being late. Um, 
Anyway, um, the Institute for Working Economy has been taking somewhat of a different approach, partly because our scope is national and we, we work in different places and with different groups. Um, so our stakeholders um, um, vary a bit from a lot of the other organizations here who focus more locally. Uh, we launched, uh, the first one was on April 21st, a um, series of conversations that we were calling the day after conversation. Um, and it was designed um, to, it is designed uh, to bring together uh, various uh, constituencies within a community to address what they believe are the current circumstances to think back about what was existing prior to the pandemic in terms of how work structures are changing, what's driving those changes, um, the um, conditions that are uh, current, and what they and and to think prospectively in terms of how uh, the um, the pandemic and uh, has presented both challenges and opportunities uh, as as and and it can be used as an inflection point <clears throat> uh, to promoting um, more progressive uh, uh, economic development strategies and workforce development strategies. The, the first event that we had was actually on April 21st here in Chicago. Uh, and I'm happy to see that the Funders Alliance for Work, uh, uh, the Funders Alliance for Workforce, uh, 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 Workforce Issues uh, is effectively following our lead in terms of organizing an initiative with Chicago Jobs Council and others that um, I think pursue a lot of the same themes that we introduced at that meeting and they, they were, um, CJC and others were part of our conversation then. Um, the, um, um, the project has changed a bit uh, in the last three weeks um, as it, it's always had a, a major focus on issues of structural racism, um, the way we designed it. Uh, but the, um, uh, the difference now is that uh, with with the uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, the demonstrations that have have uh, ensued, um, we've we've taken out a much more direct uh, conversation um, around structural racism and how the, the issues of structural racism and the consequences of the pandemic um, intersect. Um, the meetings are organized; they have four beats to them. Um, I did improv for a while, so I use that language. Uh, the first part is, um, first beat is sort of a, what's the contour today? We usually bring in a subject matter expert uh, to talk a bit about uh, what the circumstances are today uh, in the, you know, in terms of jobs and economic activity. Uh, the second beat is uh, each of the uh, community uh, stakeholders participate in the, you know, offer their ideas in terms of what they're experiencing uh, and what they see prospectively as, as both the obstacles and challenges and the, and the potential opportunities for the future. The third is to come up with some common themes. And the fourth is to um, um, come in with uh, come to some conclusions in terms of what are the next steps. Um, uh, we're, um, I'm not sure what we're going to be doing back in Cook County in Chicago, uh, given some of the work that the other groups are already picking up on this. We have uh, two planned for Charlotte, North Carolina. We have three in the, uh, with um, organizations across the country uh, that work and employ workers with disability. Um, we have one uh, planned for um, working with uh, ministers in rural communities in North and South Carolina. Uh, we're planning one for uh, long-term healthcare providers in Massachusetts. And we're in conversations with a couple of other national organizations uh, with extensive urban networks to um, support their um, uh, day after conversations. Um, the uh, funding for this is a bit spotty, but um, we're doing this as a, uh, we're bootstrapping this as part of our longer term strategy anyway, with respect to our initiative on achieving the promise of work. 
um, the, the trends and issues that we'll be monitoring closely, um, I, I think, are, are going to be uh, specifically um, whether we, we will see um, trends that existed prior to the pandemic in terms of growing gaps in wealth and income, if those um, get accelerated uh, during, uh, during the course period of day after, um, whether, um, <clears throat> particularly whether questions around structural racism um, really do, and, and the demonstrations there, um, redo, uh, truly do heighten awareness in terms of the gross disparities that exist um, uh, that, that penalize um, communities of color um, and, and how that might, might occur. One of the things that we're going to be watching also carefully, and this has to do with our work with the National Governors Association around the gig economy, is whether we'll see um, any changes in um, prior trends in the growth of independent work. Um, our, our sense is, following some of the um, what's happened in prior recessions, um, that two things are going to happen and they're going to contribute, I think, to a rapid growth in, um, in, in the informal economy. Uh, one is um, going to be, uh, I think, uh, with the cost of capital being close to zero, um, there's going to be um, a, a greater interest, higher, heightened interest by employers to um, purchase automation uh, or machines and so forth to perform the work that otherwise were being performed by low-wage workers. This recession is especially distinguished by the fact that this has hit low-wage workers hardest and first. Prior recessions, that's not been the case. Um, and so the, uh, the margins in terms of um, you know, preserving or rehiring low-wage workers versus employing capital and you know, machinery uh, in their, in their uh, place I think has really changed in terms of the, I think that calculation has changed substantially because of the recession. We'll see if that in fact bears out. The second is that um, um, with workers longer, uh, with lower income workers um, suffering longer term un unemployment, um, we anticipate that there's gonna be a, a boom economy It may mean a rush to um, um, form your own businesses, uh, even if they're not incorporated, um, or to form cooperatives or other sorts of ventures uh, with other people who are experiencing the same uh, conditions. Um, this is often talked about as essential entrepreneurship. I just refer to it as making things, making, making do. Um, and um, the, the real challenge is that uh, in order for this to be a viable option, you know, the, are there pathways for workers to convert these uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial ventures, as informal as they may be, into something that's more uh, longer term and sustainable? Um, and I think that there's a role for the public workforce system to play in this. Uh, it's not one that the public workforce system has done much with. Um, because of just frankly the lack of any guidance from the Department of Labor, uh, but they do have the capacity to support entrepreneurship um, through a variety of means. And the question is whether um, this will become a, a matter of concern. In terms of how CMAP and the committee can best uh, support our work, um, our efforts, I think that Chicago and Cook is, is still a great laboratory and, and place to um, try a lot of ideas, um, and you know, we have been in touch with other organizations in Cook um, along some of these issues. Um, and so, with respect to how the CMAP can organize this, uh, would, would in, in terms of organizing information and examples and um, um, strategies and so forth, I think it would be useful. Great. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Uh, Christy, if you have any updates uh, from the South Atlantic. Uh, sure. Hi. 
Uh, Chris T. De Laurentiis with South Suburban Mayors and Managers. Uh, we represent 45 municipalities in the South Suburbs. Um, really what's been our priority over the last several months is looking at how do we uh, how do we as an organization, a council of government, help support our municipalities that are really challenged? Uh, I'm hoping that all of you are recognizing that uh, the world changed um, in March, and that includes uh, kind of the traditional uh, <clears throat> revenues that were generated throughout the economy uh, that help uh, fund municipalities and and uh, and their direct services for residents and businesses. So right now, most of the municipalities in the south suburbs that did not have like essentially a rainy day fund have been um, really challenged and had uh, layoffs and furloughs uh, trying to manage their uh, spent expenditures. And um, some of them have already moved into deficit spending, which always creates trouble, especially with uh, the the revenue forecast uh, being slow going forward. So SSMMA has been um, helping work with municipalities on how they're managing, what kind of resources, and we're starting to look at, at uh, and we should know more today, about the CARES Act distribution in Cook County that's coming to uh, municipalities. So we're focusing on that and, and uh, interested in the equitable uh, distribution of those funds. So stay tuned on that and how that impacts individual municipalities and what they're doing. I would also say that SSMMA is an is a council of government we're set up a little bit differently than anyone else in uh, the region, uh, but we have uh, a full-time planner and we have two GIS analysts on our staff. And so we've essentially created a COVID-19 dashboard that's specific to our geography is pulling both county and state uh, data uh, on a daily basis or twice daily basis as it gets updated uh, at the state level and on the county level uh, and providing a resource site to our municipality and others. Uh, it's an open site, but essentially we're tracking contagion rates, death, death rates per municipality, uh, and then identifying those by zip code and then tracking those we're also looking at um, the Restore Illinois phases and where we are and trying to apply that regionally. There's a lot of local plans, so we're making those available. We're tracking unemployment data there and uh, using as resources and um, other uh, American Community Survey data uh, to kind of uh, create some numbers and uh, apply that to our region as a whole and then we're now starting to try to break those down looking at IDES uh, data over you know from aggregate 2019 or average 2019 and then the the subsequent months so that we can really get an understanding of how directly our municipalities are being impacted so again we've been trying to have this um, resource site that's available to folks the other thing that I would say, um, I think we presented um, on our South Suburban Economic Growth Initiative, specifically last fall, we launched a Southland Development Authority, which was a new institution in Illinois that's really a um, public-private initiative with philanthropic dollars helping us, uh, helping to stand it up uh, with support from Cook County, SSMMA, and then a partnership with a local land bank, which is bringing a lot of uh, municipalities into the fold, in addition to our organization. So that was really designed to be um, a new institution that's transformative uh, for big projects. And again, this was pre-COVID. Uh, and then we quickly to uh, uh, expand our uh, mission and pivot and include uh, look at a recovery or a stabilization, or as I like to say, a triage, immediate triage uh, for small businesses in the community. So if we don't retain and maintain those, sustain those uh, businesses, we'll have a lot steeper climb uh, into the future. So we've been facing on an equitable uh, recover, recovery stimulus program 
in partnership with our Southland Small Business Development Center, uh, which is linked to SSMMA. And initially, we um, started with uh, trying to help uh, small business and independents, independent contractors uh, secure um, CARES Act funding through the uh, PPP program. So really looking at kind of how do we provide, help them get some relief. And then we're also looking at how do we uh, provide some mentorship and guidance. So we brought in a lot of pro bono experts uh, to help uh, individual business owners think through uh, restoring both getting workers back into the workplace, but also uh, rebuilding and growing. So kind of mentoring them, mentoring them into the next phase. So we really do see this as a, um, as we heard earlier, kind of a, a, a immediate midterm and long-term strategy for regrowing the economy in the South suburbs. And the goal there is to uh, really make, again, just uh, ensuring stability of existing businesses, but helping them flourish and grow. And uh, we wanna make sure that private contractors and others are uh, getting back to work on some of the projects that are coming through the Rebuild Illinois. So we have a lot of um, uh, MBE, DBE, WBE uh, contractors in our region, and we wanna make sure that they're uh, earning uh, awards and then also recirculating those dollars to their workforce and back into the community. So that's um, uh, you know, a priority for us. And then lastly, I think to talk uh, to this group about is we've been monitoring, uh, closely monitoring the Cook County uh, assessor's reassessment of the South Triad. And, and not only is he reassessing the South Triad, he's actually uh, adjusting uh, the entire Cook County region, all the triads uh, with a COVID factor. So the, co uh, the assessor's office is applying a COVID factor to um, residential and uh, some commercial properties to uh, uh, to provide relief during this um, you know this pandemic, uh, and his premise is that he's um, following well that uh, housing uh, values decline following unemployment, and so we're monitoring what that net impact will be across the region because this is uh, typically, and I'm not sure how many kind of get into the weeds or follow the, this um, process, but typically uh, the reassessment process is an opportunity to gain value in your property and then lower your uh, tax rates because there's more uh, value. So many of you have heard over, I, mean, I think all of our lives, at least, it's always been kind of in the back of my mind that uh, land and, and properties is always a good investment, right? It always uh, seems to increase in value. There's always a demand. True, I think on aggregate that has been true. And now with COVID and some other, um, you know, the, the housing bubble of 2008 and, um, and then the Great Recession, I think that has been uh, more challenged, but more, uh, I guess, less true or or not as um, transparent. One of the things that we're looking at is um, whether or not the COVID factor inadvertently impacts, for example, uh, large um, affordable housing units, making them unaffordable, uh, which I think will be a, a detriment to the entire region. We're also looking at how it potentially shifts um, some of the property tax burden off of residential onto the backs of businesses in areas that are already challenged to maintain those businesses. So again, we're, we're taking a very close look at that and really trying to scrutinize and um, uh, use our SSMMA staff to, to make some uh, projections on how this will impact uh, both local taxpayers and then the long-term economic climate in the South Suburbs. So uh, I think just wrapping up, how can CMAP and the committee best support the efforts 
if anyone's working on this or paying attention to how it may impact any of your slices uh, of the issue areas, subject matter that you uh, focus, I'd love to have a conversation with you, just trying to get a big, you know, better understanding of, um, you know, kind of how to interpret some of the data that we're seeing. And, um, and then I would just suggest that the committee kind of uh, keep their pulse on this. Um, if you're not following Cook County reassessment process, uh, it's divided into three triads. Uh, now it's the South and West suburbs. Next year it'll be the city proper and then the North suburbs the following year. So uh, it will, you know, it may have a, uh, a kind of a multifaceted impact. It's hard to know at this moment. And I think after we finish member updates, we're going to hear from at least my personal tax guru, if not uh, CMAP as a whole guru, Lindsay Hollander, on some of the analysis she's been doing on the potential effects of the pandemic and efforts to contain it on municipal revenues. But I did want to return to some of the points we were making about layering data together. I know this is something that Mari and I had, had discussed last week uh, about the how to layer different pieces of information and data to help just you know, continue to color the picture on who is being affected by the pandemic and the challenges they face. And of course, CMAP is charged with being a data hub for the region. So there are a lot of resources that we have uh, to support that. I think that this would be a great time, uh, since we're going slightly out of order here, to hear from Marissa Lewis, who is uh, rejoining us as representing the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. There seems to be some overlap here. And so maybe we can just get a a little bit of a connection to to what Christy was just talking about as well. Marissa, I hate to put you on the spot, but I hope you'll be willing to share. So you are fine. I want to make sure you can hear me right now. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, sometimes I have issues with my headset. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marissa Lewis from the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. I'm sorry I couldn't join um, right when the meeting started. Um, I am new to the committee. Um, this is my first meeting. We previously had different um, rep representation on the committee. Um, so I'm pleased to be um, with you all and meeting you all and, and, and listening to the discussion thus far. Um, so we actually at the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership um, just wrapped up kind of prior to COVID and the shutdown had just wrapped up our four year strategic plan. Um, and we had um, just kind of upped, uh, ramped up our strategic focus on geographies and, and populations of highest need. Um, and again, for those, I'm sure you're all familiar with us um, because we've been you know, and other capacities on this committee for a while, but we represent the public workforce development system um, for Chicago and Cook County. Um, and so again, we were just, um, you know, because of our funding, we are focused on communities and populations of, of high need, but just decided through our strategic planning process to really um, kind of sharpen the focus. Um, and then when COVID hit, um, since then, you know, the, the economy has been pretty hard hit. I'm sure you've been through all the data um, and, you know, it has really, this pandemic has really exacerbated existing disparities. Um, you know, the, the data has shown that industry sectors that are hardest hit by COVID um, do have high proportions of workers of color. Um, there's kind of a health focus as well. Um, you know, a lot of occupations that are, you know, high exposure sort of frontline occupations do have high proportions of workers of color there as well. Um, so we're really looking at that data and seeing how that kind of folds into our strategic focus. Um, we've been also on the on the lookout for, for new data that can help us understand um, not just kind of what's been happening already, but, but if the recovery kind of starts to take place, moving into additional phases um, of the recovery, how we can kind of monitor that pulse and, and strategically deploy our WIOA services and, and, and our other programming as well to make sure that we can take advantage of that, you know, recoveries flow as it may be um, and make sure to get people trained for the jobs that are coming back online. Um, so one of the additional pieces of data that we have started looking at is um, I think just in the last couple of weeks, um, we've been in contact. I'm not sure if there's anybody from IDES, Illinois Department of Employment Security, on this committee, um, but they do report on the unemployment claims. We've all seen kind of the overall weekly claims and the huge spike um, that has happened in recent months, um, but they have also started to put out um, additional data by county um, of which occupations, um, or I'm sorry, they started with which industries these claimants are coming from week by week. So we're able to see kind of those trends. The biggest one so far has been accommodation and food services, um, but we're able not just to see kind of the totals, but the trends week by week. Um, at what point in the pandemic have different occupations, or I'm sorry, have different industries started to be hit 
um, by this. Um, and we're going to continue to get those reports on a biweekly basis. Um, and uh, hopefully soon, um, in addition to industries of claimants, we'll start to see occupations of claimants kind of within each industry. So really to drill down on who has been um, affected by this um, and maybe even be able to see for some of those industries that may not come back for a while, um, like those that feature large gatherings, entertainment and things like that, um, see how we can kind of redeploy some of those skills into occupations that are and industries that are coming back. Um, we also have long looked at um, job postings data um, on a regular basis basis just to see kind of a, an alternative to government data, um, see what the real-time job uh, posting volume looks like by industry and by occupation. And so that's another one that we've been monitoring. Um, it has, to date, we've looked at who has been, um, who's taken kind of the biggest plunge in terms of posting volume, um, but, but it, you know, as we kind of move along, we're going to start to see kind of upticks in posting volume, and that'll help us to get kind of an idea of um, employer confidence, possibly, um, and, and, and employer openings. Um, so we're monitoring that as well. Um, just looking at your discussion questions, um, how we've adjusted our strategies. Um, so we at the partnership um, operate 10 American job centers around Cook County, and then a, um, a number of additional kind of smaller delegate agencies that provide our programming, um, and those have all long been very face-to-face, -face, um, in-person career coaching, um, you know, uh, job training and things like that um, focused. And so we've had to move all of that in a relatively short period of time um, into online virtual services. Um, so now there are, you know, online enrollments for WIOA um, individuals, access to, uh, access to career coaches online. Um, we have, um, you know, out rolled out a new uh, 800 number. Um, we've been posting uh, po uh, jobs that are hiring now on our website and updating that on a weekly basis. Um, we have moved a lot of our training to online. So we have a um, digital literacy program that serves 600 people a month that the partnership itself runs. Um, and some of our other programming um, that has been kind of in person, we've moved that to online. Um, same thing with our assistance to businesses. Um, and we also are serving on a number of um, econ or at least two um, economic recovery task forces um, run by the city and the county. Um, so I guess that's kind of a high level of, of what we've been looking at and how we've adjusted our service offerings. Um, I'll have to think about how kind of CMAP and the committee um, can, can kind of help with that. I know we've long relied on your data, um, in particular your neighborhood and municipality data. Um, since we are a countywide organization, we looked not just at Chicago neighborhoods, but at um, at the county municipalities as well. And the um, the reports that CMAP puts out on a, the snapshot reports that you put out on, a, on an annual basis have just been invaluable to us. And we share them widely whenever we get requests for, um, for neighborhood specific data. So, um, so far that's been a great help to us. Great, always be here that our, our data products are being used I know there's also a great deal of interest in uh, getting more um, timely data from IDES. I think a lot of people on the phone will agree that they've been a little frustrated at, at um, how closely they've been able to monitor the trends in the state. Uh, to that end, if John Furr, do you have any updates given your uh, experience with labor market information and data? Sure, I'm certainly happy to. Um, hi, hi, everyone. I'm John Furrow with Education Systems Center at NIU. Sorry for being late. I was also thrown off by the by the calendar cancellation. Um, but in terms of the work for our organization, we focus on uh, college and career pathways work at both the state level and working with various regions, including work, uh, working closely with uh, Chicago Public Schools and City Colleges in those efforts, uh, other college and career readiness strategies, as well as data-related efforts. And I'd say in terms of, um, you know, the work that we've been doing in, uh, in response to uh, COVID-19 has, has involved looking at ways a lot of the uh, systems building work we've been doing around career pathways could still continue on. So working with communities around uh, building out the work-based learning systems, trying to focus with them how many of those components can shift to more virtual models and how they can be meaningful and still engaging with employers despite the lack of the ability to have um, in, 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 in person placement for those. Um, also being able to, you know, to, to assess some of the impacts that we anticipate with respect to health science and IT, manufacturing, kind of other priority. Uh, 
Um, and then we've been doing a lot of work uh, throughout the state on districts that have been moving to more competency-based uh, uh, approaches to um, education. And, and that works in, certainly in, in light of COVID-19 is taking a uh, uh, higher priority to see what we can learn from those districts that have been completing the field in terms of competency-based models and see what, what lessons that we can help to broadcast as, as uh, districts think about um, different approaches for next school year, which uh, I know while they're still working through what those models might be, the likelihood that it'll go back to learning as normal is, is certainly slim. Um, but within the context of that, we've also been, uh, in, in light of the George Floyd killing and you know the uh, uh, the, the focus on uh, systemic racism throughout our country have been trying to refocus our, our efforts around um, how do we not just focus on scaling college and career pathway efforts, but really supporting those, uh, uh, being able to target those to, uh, to, to young people throughout our state who have been left out of both access and supports for completing those systems. And I think we're trying to look at the resources that we have access to through our organization at the state level to try to better uh, target pathway models that again can support students to be aware of uh, what are the um, occupations that provide opportunities for a living wage in tomorrow's, in tomorrow's economy, kind of supporting the stages that are needed from access to coursework through access to the work-based learning and continuation of those pathways on to, again, to those, uh, to those, promising, to those promising occupations in the region. So that's a role that we certainly see from CMAP being able to um, both support the data around you know the shifts in, in the occupational areas as well as i think the work that cmap has done historically looking at uh, the economically uh, disconnected communities within our region being a, being able to understand that there's a geography to uh, um, systemic racism within our region that impacts how we look at the um, education system and work with schools and work with districts and really needing to make a close connection in that with the type of work that we're looking to do moving forward um, but we also do a lot of work with data. Uh, there is significant work happening at the state level to better connect and make accessible data systems to various stakeholders for a number of research projects. You know, I, I'd say that our work has not necessarily been directly um, involved with changes to the IDES internal systems. We are looking to better make sure that we can connect up the IDES data associated with outcomes to education programs at both the secondary and post-secondary levels. And, and that work is continuing to be a priority for uh, this um, uh, administration at, at, at the state level, despite the uh, shifts that have been made in the last six, seven months as, uh, as a result of COVID-19. So um, I, think, uh, I think that pretty much provides a summary for, for our work. Great, Thank, thanks, John. Have there been much discussion about trying to incorporate more uh, sort of uh, leapfrog training on digital literacy as part of these career pathway programs? I mean, digital literacy has been part of the, the conversation within the workforce development system and education systems for so long, but I'm curious if this uh, current situation has changed that in any way. You know, I mean, where where I'm starting to see some of the conversations move. I mean, there's obviously the general need, I think, for digital for digital literacy skills for for all young people and for all and um, um, for all adults that are looking to continue their career pathways and their education work. You know, I, I think we're saying is we were we were part of a we're leading a statewide committee working with the Illinois Community College Board designing a health science pathways and you know, there's beginning to emphasize what are the needs for telehealth related skills, for example, for all jobs in health sciences. Um, even as we look beyond uh, uh, the COVID-19 response, knowing that more young people need to be able to have those skill sets to be able to be be um, uh, effective in, in future in future health science jobs. So, you know, there are there are different I think career areas where there's general foundation for digital literacy that's certainly needed for all students, but it's also starting to impact how we think about training young people for career pathways in different areas as well. Any questions or comments for John? Okay. Uh, Brian Gay from Aurora, do you have any updates? Uh, thanks, Austin. Just, you know, just a few things. I mean, obviously, since, you know, since March, you know, we have had to uh, really kind of change the way we do some of the things here. Obviously, with my staff, we're all able to uh, we're all able to to work from home, but now, you know, but now, you know, since we've been doing that, you know, it's been a, a steady, 
change in the focus of, of what we're doing as well. So one of the things that we are, we're going to continue to um, monitor in the, in the workplace is obviously before, you know, before March, uh, the labor market was very tight. We had a number of new projects coming into town. And one of the things that we had touted, uh, you know, over other locations, yeah, either in the state or outside of the state, was the availability of you know certain part, you know, certain sections of our of our workforce. And now, you know, there's some uncertainty that you know, with all the layoffs, is if if you know those uh, if those components of the workforce are still available, what does that you know now look like? And you know, so so we're having to do some work on that. So any information. Uh, the IDS or, or any of the groups can can provide on what this new workforce looks like or what it will look like, you know, it'd be very helpful on our end. Um, but then, you know, on top of that, you know, we're also, you know, we've had to, you know, spend the last six, six seven weeks now um, reviewing a uh, loan documentation for our CDBG uh, grant the stable fund to help out our, our businesses. We've done, you know, we've taken up fundraising for the businesses that were uh, that uh, received you know, physical damage uh, from the civil unrest back on June 30 for, or on uh, uh, May 31st. So we're now doing fundraising for that and creating a program. So there's just a lot of different pieces that you know are similar, but you know, but in many ways very different from what we were doing before. Um, otherwise, you know. Yeah, we have prospective businesses continuing to to look at Aurora. Uh, we have you know businesses you know in town looking to expand. So those items may not have changed. Uh, but then too, uh, you know we're also uh, we just recently uh, completed a survey of about 500 of our businesses. Um, on expectations and best practices for dealing with COVID. And, you know, we did a number of roundtable discussions, uh, <clears throat> which, you know, is no different than what we've done in the past. But again, you know, specific to, to COVID related issues. So uh, we produced the one, uh, the first parts of that project last week. Uh, and, you know, it turned out to be a 52 page document, in which we summarized everything that we could find from either the CDC, different um, plans from city, states, uh, counties, and kind of boiled it all into ours and, uh, you know, best practices. And then, yeah, the survey data uh, should be out later on this week. So we're keeping ourselves busy, obviously, like it's, and it's a little bit different, but, you know, most things have not changed. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, you know, the best way that CMAP can, you know, help support our efforts is just, you know, providing, you know, helping to provide and encourage uh, other organizations to provide uh, accurate and updated information as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Great. Thanks, Brian. And much like uh, Chrissy's comments on municipal revenue, we also hope to hear from, uh, sir, from Timmy on a survey that uh, CMAP has done on, on the needs of our municipalities as well. Okay, it looks like next would be Emily Harris. Do you have any updates? I believe you're muted. Yes, okay. Uh, hello, good to see everybody uh, virtually. Um, so as many of you know, I left the Chicago Community Trust back in um, October to return to my consulting practice, Harris Strategies. And I want to talk about um, two different, uh, we're, two different hats I wear. One is um, my primary client is the President's Council on Disability Inclusion in Philanthropy. That's an effort put together by um, 16 foundations uh, led by the Ford and Robert Wood Johnson Foundations to raise the bar on how philanthropy includes people with disabilities explicitly in all of its programming. And um, the two Chicago foundations involved in that are the Chicago Community Trust and MacArthur Foundation. Um, then uh, I also want to make a couple comments on um, vis a vis my role as a council member of the Conservation and Policy Council for the Forest Reserves of Cook County. Um, but I'll start with the disability side because that's really where I've been spending a lot of my 
time and effort. And really what um, has been striking for people with disabilities about the uh, COVID um, epidemic is how it has revealed in a very dramatic way the structural ableism that permeates our society. And that's a word I really didn't use comfortably before the pandemic, but I think um, with examples like medical rationing, where when there were concerns about hospitals being overrun, there were explicit conversations about people with disabilities being last in line to receive ventilators and even cases in states like Kansas where there were actual policies written saying that people who came in with ventilators could have them taken away to serve other quote unquote healthier patients. Um, it was really a stark reminder that our society val does not value people with disabilities in the same way that it values um, people who are quote unquote normal despite the fact that any of us can become disabled at any time. So um, I think the, the um, percentage of people with disabilities who have been negatively impacted by uh, the pandemic, um, you know, if you look at communities of color, there's a higher percentage of people with disabilities in those communities to begin with, especially the black community. And so those people who are multiply marginalized are absolutely at the very bottom of the list in terms of um, who's uh, being, or you could say the top of the list of who's being impacted by, by the pandemic. Um, in addition to issues related to, uh, to work and losing jobs and increased exposure, you have the issue of people who receive home and community-based services who have been unable to access care because they're caregivers may be impacted. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, people who live in nursing homes um, and other institutions, as we all know, are the highest impacted. So a ton of policy issues, a ton of um, systems issues, and also a very clear intersection between systemic ableism and systemic racism is very much coming to the fore. And the, the foundations that I um, I'm working with are recognizing that, recognizing that just the same way uh, systemic racism is kind of fundamentally, its history has to do with how people's bodies are valued, dating all the way back to enslavement when enslaved people were valued monetarily based on the strength of their bodies. Uh, it's a very similar impulse and highly intertwined with the way we value people with disabilities. So. Um, lots of lots of reflection, lots of um, work along those lines, and of course, many of the many of the um, African American people who have been killed by police actually were disabled people. So, um, lots of issues and intersections. Uh, some of the positive um, things that have happened under the COVID. Uh, epidemic have been the incredible shift to remote work which is something that many people with disabilities had been asking for for years as an accommodation. There was a lot of chatter early on about, oh, gee, look at this. Uh, you couldn't give that to me, but now that everybody needs it, all of a sudden it's possible. Um, so that's the, the uh, slightly more negative view, but the more positive view is that this opens the workplace to many, many people who have been unable to access it in the past not only because of disability, but because of other needs to have flexible um, work schedules. Uh, so one of the questions as we return to work is, do we protect that new access, but also do we make sure that we don't use that access as an excuse to not have accessible facilities? Um, so I'm hearing disability policymakers raise concerns about both so that we make sure that um, first of all, the remote access we do have incorporates accessibility principles and best practices. So how are we making sure that people who are deaf and hard of hearing are getting captioning on, on Zoom meetings and things like that? How are we making sure uh, that people who are blind or low vision are receiving materials that are made accessible? But also, and then how do we take those new tools 
keep them in the workplace so that we have increased flexibility. Um, and then finally, how do we make sure we don't use it as an excuse uh, to not make everything more accessible when we are in person so that people who are multiply marginalized don't get left behind again. Um, in terms of CMAP's role in disability inclusion, I think this discussion of data reminds me that we've had discussions before about how it's hard to get granular data on disability. I think there's a number of, of places and partnerships to look. One is at the University of Illinois. Um, Janet Smith has done a lot of work in this area. There's the uh, PARC, P-A-R-C-C -C project um, that is housed at, at UIC. And then um, nationally, the Kessler Foundation is funding uh, Dartmouth University to do work on disability employment that's um, constantly updated and has some information. Um, so that there's an area where there's uh, an opportunity maybe for CMAP to learn, aggregate, and maybe even innovate in terms of uh, figuring out how to, how to make that um, dimension of, um, of our population, a, a piece that's regularly incorporated. Um, secondly, reaching out as you're thinking about um, uh, moving forward to those disability-led organizations in our region. So that would include all of the centers for independent living, uh, access living among them, but each county or there's several within the region. The Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus has been doing some interesting work um, with disability coordinators, but I think also starting to think about citizens commissions and um, how to bring those groups of sort of grassroots advocates together um, from, the, from the suburban uh, communities. And that might be an opportunity for CMAP to connect with, um, and then of course the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, which is about to have a a new commissioner, Rachel Arfa, I'm very excited about, about that. Um, so lots of opportunity, I think, for CMAP to uh, continue uh, what you started with, with GoTo 2050 and, and bring that population um, to the fore. And then I just wanted to mention the work I've been doing, uh, totally different hat with the, Chicago, with the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, our Conservation and Policy Council over the last two years has been doing position papers looking at key issues um, related to implementation of the Next Century Conservation Plan. And the most um, first position paper, I'm proud to say, to be um, adopted just last week by the council and will be promoted to um, the commissioners for adoption is one on racial equity. Um, I co-chaired that effort with Shelley Spencer of WTTW and um, basically the paper calls for the Forest Preserve to take a racial equity lens to all of its futures programs, policies, and investments and lays out a series of criteria for doing that, um, including basically just looking at who's, who's benefit and who's burdened, CMAP's data on impacted community was at the heart of that paper. So it was really, really helpful to have that data available to us and interesting that the conversations earlier um, in the process raised questions about, well, should we be looking at economics? Should we be looking at race? And very clearly um, now there's no question that race is, is primary to that conversation. But thank you for that data. Thank you for making that possible. The, the process that the Forest Preserve will be taking in the future includes looking at the possibility of racial equity impact assessments on new investments, um, in which very deeply engage uh, those impacted communities. And also, I I think a little bit of a twist on um, looking at who benefits and who's burdened is the paper calls for looking at does this next step contribute to a cycle of disinvestment? So reminding um, the, the administration and the commissioners that uh, often we may say, well, you know, this golf course isn't performing, 
but maybe it's not performing because we disinvested in it because it was adjacent to an impacted community. So um, I think that's just, I, I bring that up with that level of detail just to remind CMAP that that may be um, a model for including in future planning efforts. Um, we certainly will. I mean, we're in the middle of doing some internal work planning strategic efforts, uh, particularly now that Aaron Allman has sort of been able to fully take the helm as executive director and set a course for the agency. And, you know, from the conversations we've had so far, disinvestment will continue to be a sort of the center, one of the central pillars of our economic work going forward. Excellent. Excellent. So I just also wanted to say that I need to jump off a call at 11 for a forest preserve call. So I didn't want anybody to think I was abandoning you. This has been a great conversation and I'm learning so much from everybody. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Before, uh, before you move on to the next, can I just ask Emily a, a question? Is, uh, is that report ready yet or is that anything that could be shared publicly? Uh, yeah. Recommendations or search? It was approved by the council last week, so um, I don't think it's been disseminated yet, but um, I'll find out. Uh, you know, I can certainly send a, a PDF and I'll on the website. That would be great, thank you. I, haven't, I hadn't seen it and I am interested in, uh, you know, kind of digging into that a little bit more. So thanks for sharing those, that brief summary. Yeah, you know, it was interesting, um, Christy, specifically because um, one of the issues that came up is land acquisition. And there was initially questions about, well, do we depart from our mission of ecological conservation and high priority areas? And um, the council very much decided, no, that's still our mission. It's a question of... But great news because the whole Calumet region is is extremely high priority. So um, there's there's a great synergy opportunity there to uh, work with the communities we want to um, increase access to the forest preserve through a land acquisition. Great. Okay, Michael Horsing with RTA. Yeah. Good, good morning, Austin. Everyone else. Um, Michael Horstein with the uh, Regional Transportation Authority. And um, really the, the pandemic has been a significant challenge to the Chicago region's transit system. And um, as you can imagine with changes in work from home orders, et cetera, it really has had a strong uh, impact to the ridership levels as well as the funding of uh, the system. But public transit remains a, an essential service. So we're still, transporting healthcare employees and emergency responders and, and, and other workers who are not working from home. Uh, we're still doing that throughout the region today. So we, uh, the RTA, along with our uh, service boards, um, CTA, Metra, PACE, are, are, are still committed to you know, protecting the safety of uh, the customers and, and the employees working behind the scenes um, and uh, working to identify uh, to really address the impacts to ridership and services and, and finances. So we're, we're continuously uh, assessing the, the pandemic's unfolding impacts to our service uh, and to its finances, uh, carefully planning out how to adjust those operations and investments so riders can safely um, continue to use the service and meet their mobility needs, needs both now but going forward into tomorrow and next week and next month. Um, and then also working to really coordinate a clear communications uh, to the general public, to writers and even elected officials and, and stakeholders. Um, one way of doing that is, Christy had mentioned a, a dashboard. We also have a COVID-19 transit specific dashboard that we launched um, with frequent status on updates about transit ridership and operations and, and finance uh, throughout our part of the state. Um, and, and you can use the, uh, the dashboard to just really understand the impacts um, of today's uh, trends, both ridership and, and finance, as compared to you know, a typical year using data from 2019. Um, we, we do also um, send out uh, communications and e-blasts to elected officials. Um, they're very interested in what's 
how uh, the transit system across the region is reacting to the, the pandemic. Um, and then also we're working very hard to just, of course, um, understand the impacts and the effects of funding on the transit system since that's such a large component of our charge. Um, so since the stay at home order began, you know, there's been significant reductions, as I mentioned, in service and ridership and fares. And when you combine that with reduction in, in sales tax receipts, the projected loss just for 2020 is um, pushing a billion dollars. Um, so that's um, a big thing for us to work towards. Um, thankfully, through the CARES Act, a few others have mentioned it already on the, on the meeting today, uh, the CARES Act did provide 25 billion nationwide for transit systems, um, 1.4 of which is coming to our region. So that is some good news uh, for the RTA. Um, and, and those funds can be used to reimburse you know, operating costs and maintain, maintaining service levels, even though there might be very um, limited ridership going on uh, due to the pandemic. Um, so we've been really struggling through all of those and working together in a coordinated fashion, uh, all four agencies, RTA, CTA, and Metro and FACE to do that. Um, just how, um, you know, we can tap into CMAP's ex expertise and, and also the use of this committee. Uh, we continue to think of other ways that the RTA can respond to the pandemic and really uh, support the return of the economy in some form or fashion, especially in transit served areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, folks in our planning department, my group is, uh, uh, as well specifically, are trying to think of other ways. We're still doing that, that discussion internally. What that looks like is funding that we can identify to support small businesses and transit served areas. Um, many of you know that we've done a lot of work to identify economic development opportunities throughout our region in transit served areas. So we want to support that continuing effort um, and really do uh, find an equitable way to um, distribute if we find other ways to react um, you know, to places that need it most. And uh, so that could be a way where we can uh, really tap into the expertise of this committee as well as CMAP uh, once we uh, further flush that idea out. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, next would be Kevin Kramer, I think. Cool. Um... Um, I think my, my Kevin counterpart, I, I would echo some of what he said and, and certainly what, um, what Brian mentioned a little bit. Um, so I'm the Director of Economic Development in Hoffman Estates here up in Northwest Um I, I think the, the couple things I will mention and highlight is, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely adapting. First of all, we're open again. Um, so that's why I'm in my office. Uh, working from home was a challenge because I, I do have those four young children under the age of six. And they just don't understand why dad is at work when he's downstairs. Um, so they still want to come uh, join my calls with me. Um, so being at, at the office is kind of refreshing. I can actually get some work done. Um, we opened up uh, June 1st um, back to having um, uh, residents or whomever else, pub the public might uh, want to come into the building to do whatever, drop off a permit, pay water bills, whatever. Um, speaking of permits, uh, we've seen the biggest month and a half of permit uh, permits and permit revenues uh, this past month and a half than we have, um, well, th since 2000. Um, so for 20 years, this is the biggest month. Hanging back while I'm on their Zoom call saying, oh, I need a new fence. Let me go get a fence permit. Um, so we've seen a lot of investment in, in residential. Um, we've seen also a lot of continued investment. I, I think Brian mentioned it. Of yeah, we're still having those those projects that were coming that were starting before uh, are, are still continuing to develop. Um, and, and
and T headquarter campus. So it's a 1.6 million square foot office building uh, right along I-90. And uh, um, about a year, about a little over a year ago, a developer purchased it after we created a TIF um, and did an, an agreement with them. And they are in the building. They are renovating half of the existing building right now. Um, and they plan by, what is today, June, by September to be open to the public again. Um, again, to be open to the public period. Before you couldn't get into the building unless you had a meeting or a badge that said you worked there. So you'll be able to go into this building um, and they're turning it into what they call a metro burg. Um, so a metropolis in suburbia. Everything you love about your, your office and, and your living down in the loop, but with all the amenities of the suburbs. Um, so they're gonna have, starting in September, they're gonna have co-working, And a coffee shop and a fitness center to start out because uh, every good office place has coffee so that was key uh, and then you got to get out and move a little bit um, so while there are paths around the site they, they are going to open the fitness center maybe a little bit after toward the end of the year um, but they're still moving full force on that um, that's a, a quarter of a billion dollar project to, to renovate that whole thing and they are are still moving full force they they've got their investors behind them that said yes let's keep moving we see this as as an as an advantage of maybe people don't want to aren't ready to go work downtown in their their office again um i was on a webinar where they talked about the challenges of of getting somebody up to the to the 30th floor and and having to take the elevators up there and if you can only fit two or three people in an elevator at a time um, it can be really challenging to get up to your office on time, to come down for lunch, to get back up after lunch, to get back down. Um, so the, the Somerset Development Group that, that's doing this um, Metro Burb, which they call Bell Works, um, they are very excited um, to, to be continuing moving forward here. Um, so certainly projects like that. Uh, and and uh, again, groups that were looking are still looking to, to move and, and locate here. Um, even just last Friday, I, I was taking a call for, for somebody that um, is looking for about 150 acres and they had identified one in Hoffman Estates um, for their build a suit manufacturing. That would be several hundred jobs. So those kinds of groups, uh, real estate really is looking beyond on this. Um, real estate development, uh, right? I, I'm sorry, I forget who said it before, but um, uh, investment is land is a, is a good is a good investment um and uh yeah so people are still looking to invest still looking to build um that i think the that is that is one point that there's still hope there um that people are looking past this especially now that um phase four is coming this friday um and and that's the other uh the answer to the first question the most immediate most immediate need of Hoffman Estates businesses really was just open back up and, and let me figure out how to make money again. Um, right, different than in 2008, in 2009, 2010, when um, they weren't, that, that, that business went out of business because they couldn't figure out a way to make money, not because they were told they had to shut down. Um, and so that's what, that's what my businesses have, have been calling and, and pleading to me for is, um, we just need to get open. And, and I, I, the sob stories of, we can't pay our mortgage at our house because our our forty year old business uh, in town is is uh, is struggling so much, or um, or or the college tuition bills are are just not going to be paid right now, um, and pushing all that off. Um, obviously, restaurants are 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 in our community are hurting the most because um, they haven't been able to be open. But I'm still hearing from those from those uh, advanced manufacturers who are saying, Kevin, we're getting by. We're, we're, we've kind of created a couple of shifts um, since we've been essential to space people out, but we're not getting the sales that we need. Um, and, and we really just need to get back again. Um, so that was kind of the biggest concern of people, which I don't think is surprising. Um, and then jumping to the last, that, the last question, yeah, I would just echo comments from others is just that data I think is gonna be important um, that, that CMAP provides um, both for our um, municipal funding and, and budgeting, um, but also kind of so what we, we can kind of gauge what to expect going forward um, based on, on what's been happening. And, and 
the more real-time data we can get, obviously the better. So with that, I'll, I'll pass and move on to the next one. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, just a quick time check. We have about 30 minutes left, and I think that we want to continue hearing from members. We have some other presentations on the agenda, but fortunately those have been written up and are available online, and we'll be happy to share the presentations and the links to the articles later on. So with that, we can take uh, volunteers from the other members who are still here to make sure we have an opportunity for people who really want to, to share items to, to do that. Is there anyone from the, the final four or five people that want to speak? Hi, this is Kathleen Nelson uh, from Christian and Wakefield. Um, this is my, my first meeting, as you mentioned. So hello to everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be at my computer. I had to be in the car a little bit. So um, I haven't been on the screen or, or seen the materials. But I thought um, it might be a good time for me to speak um, following the last speaker. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name from Hoffman Estate. The economic development director. Um, so I'm with Christian Wakefield, which is a commercial real estate company. And part, some of the ways that we've adjusted is we have uh, over 40,000 employees across the globe. And Christian and Wakefield um, in China manages 800 million square feet of space for um, companies, industrial, office, retail places in China. And so Cushman and Wakefield had to uh, react quickly to COVID, um, what to do with space and how to get, once it was ready to reopen in China and workers to go back, how to move millions of workers back into the space. So by the time things really got bad in the States, we had a lot of data already on best practices and how best to move workers back into space. So Cushman actually put a report together I think the initial report was about 400 pages and then narrowed it down to about 50 pages, which is a recovery readiness task force that we've been sharing to companies, counties, government agencies across the, across the world on how to get employees back into the workplace. And so we actually have a lot of materials on our website for recovery readiness. We've done surveys. Um, across all our employees on how the experience is working from home and different things. And what we see is really a new ecosystem of the workplace going forward. And so as far as development, um, just to follow up on some of the things that were said, we do see industrial activity, um, you know, still going forward and things happening. Obviously, retail has been a bit challenged. Um, one of the concerns is a lot of the places not opening and vacant storefronts ac across the neighborhoods and communities. But other than that, we do still see a lot of activity. Um, obviously, office investors and occupiers are relooking at their space in light of, you know, changes that are going to have to be made inside the the buildings and with elevators, as was discussed, and stuff like that. Great, thank you so much. I know several of the economic developers on the call have also been looking at how they can provide guidance to their local businesses, small and large, on how they might be able to adapt some of their space to, to make sure that employees feel safe and, and have confidence to return to the office. Okay. Any other members? Actually, uh, Austin, if I can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doug. Um, okay, uh, Doug Pryor from Will County Center for Economic Development. Um, we are the public-private uh, EDO for Will County and its communities. Um, really, I, I can be brief. It, it echoes a lot what you heard from Kevin, Kevin, and Brian. Um, what I'll say is we're similar in that we continue to see very strong project activity. Um, and, you know, we're, we're lucky enough in that this um, sort of renewed emphasis on supply chain um, has been very impactful for us and has driven a lot of real estate investment, um, both in terms of leasing existing space and maybe surprisingly, a lot of uh, developers looking at large tracts of new land in the area. So that, um, that bit of growth feels like um, good news from our perspective. Um, you know, there, there are certainly still weak spots in the market, but um, industrial, um, energy, chemical, petrochemical, a um, lot of projects in the pipeline and um, good performance in that space. And from our part, again, like a lot of the EDOs, we're, we're looking at this in both 
you know, short term and, and long term, right? In the short term, I mean, in a practical sense, we're, we're still like a lot of people in that we're focused on information dissemination. Um, I think one of the better things we've done is convene a weekly call of all of our communities uh, development teams. Um, it, it's helpful both for, you know, information dissemination from our end, but just best practices sharing uh, among our communities as, as they reopen. Um, and then the other thing is for us, and I think this is where CMAP could certainly play a role, um, we're doing our best to parse out the data and just knowing that this recession is not like past recessions and really focusing on industries that were impacted particularly hard during the last recession versus those that are in this recession and where to focus you know, our workforce energy, our job training energy. I heard someone earlier in the call uh, discussing, you know, helping people pivot to growing industries. And that's something that certainly I think is of value for us. And the better we can do um, in terms of real time information, the better decisions we can make and the better planning we can do. So certainly yeah, I think CMAP can be of help there for us as well. Great. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Kelly, I know you were wanting to talk earlier as well. Well, thank you. And, and actually, it's perfect for me to follow Doug in terms of information dissemination. So for those of you that aren't familiar with my work, I lead two uh, economic development groups hand in hand. One, I'm trying to fix my camera here. I don't know if this is working, but um, one called the Alliance for Regional Development that focuses on the Milwaukee, Chicagoland, Northwest Indiana corridor. And the sister organization is a 64-year-old group called the Chicago Central Area Committee. And the two group, uh, to the leadership of both groups came together and pretty early, uh, end of March, early April, we started doing webinars. They're generally Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1.30. Uh, for example, tomorrow though, it happens to be at two o'clock, so you have to kind of watch the notices. But tomorrow, as an example, we have the uh, leader of another a multi-state organization that's headquartered in El Paso, Texas, with a lot uh, with one state in the country of Mexico. So they're very manufacturing based. And what we're talking about is the onshoring opportunities and helping to build a better bridge between our mega region and that mega region. Um, with the Chicago Central Area Committee, we've partnered with the um, Chicago Department of Planning and Development. So in terms of the question regarding marginalized communities, we're working very closely with uh, Invest Southwest, and I'm happy to share more details uh, with anybody who might be interested in that specific work. And as many of you know, we partner with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and we host a summit on regional competitiveness. It was scheduled for November 16th. And what we're going to do is, um, at this point, we're going to plan that it will have to be virtual. So instead of having one day programming, we're going to spread it out throughout the week and have programming um, for two hours each day, the week of November 16th. So in terms of how CMAP can help, would be just making sure that the information gets out with our weekly webinars and with the summit. And if there are any topics or speakers, that you would like us to host or you know that you're particularly interested in uh, we want to make sure that that we're spreading best practices and trying to get real-time information into people's hands thank you great any other volunteers who are on the phone this hey, is so awesome. Awesome. county oh sorry go, go, go ahead Zoshi. I'll, I'll i'll chime in after you Okay, thank you. Um, well, just in the in the interest of time, I just um, will add a, a few more things that Cook County is currently doing. Um, in terms of the the recovery initiative, we're working with um, our chief financial officer and his team, and CMAP is actually um, participating as well in looking at the county's um, care CRF funding and assessing how to equitably distribute that funding across all municipalities. As part of that exercise, the Bureau of Economic Development is also looking at assessing 
the initiatives that we will be able to undertake and with with partners um, to equitably distribute those resources over the next couple of months. The CRF funding, um, we're still trying to work closely with a consultancy that's working with the CFO to assess eligibility requirements and determine which initiatives can be funded through that funding source. Um, in the meantime, what the Bureau has done was identify several initiatives um, that include loan programs and TA programs for businesses, as well as grant programs. Um, that's from the business recovery side. And from the resident side, we're looking at mortgage assistance, rental assistance, utility assistance programs, but we're still vetting those initiatives um, to assess the eligibility and figure out who else throughout the county, throughout the country has done these things successfully. And I realize that we're all learning as, as we try to build this thing, um, in particular with, with limited guidance from the treasury. We wanna make sure that the funding and the initiatives that we stand up um, actually meet the eligibility criteria, given that at the end of the day, we're, we're gonna be mon monitored and the government will come back to assess that we implemented these things appropriately. So we're, we're carefully assessing that, but also balancing the need to get these dollars out quickly and expend them by the end of the calendar year. So I'm hoping that within the next few weeks, as we finalize that process with the CFO, um, we'll be able to implement new initiatives, whether it's it's a grant program or a, an additional TA program for businesses. We're assessing the needs, but also verifying the various funding opportunities that are coming around to figure out how to best deploy those resources. And we realize that no amount of funding will meet all those needs. So ideally, we're, we're assessing how we partner with other government entities, whether it's um, the city or the state, and even philanthropy to assess how do we take the dollars that we each have and grow that pot to meet the, the greatest needs. So we'll keep individuals posted as, as we get additional um, guidance and as we assess what is actually eligible, but we're hoping to be able to implement those initiatives um, in the near future. But if anyone has successfully implemented loan programs or grant programs using federal CARES funds, that would be helpful to share. And you can send me information on the side. Thank you, Sochi. Any questions or comments there? I think Henry wanted to, to speak as well. Yeah, hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep my uh, comments brief, but Henry Pierce with ComEd Economic and Workforce Development. And, you know, over the last several months, we've really taken a variety of different measures to support our customers and communities. And I just wanted to call out a few of those. You know, just last week, we uh, announced a pretty comprehensive relief uh, package uh, that, you know, hits on a variety of things, including extending suspension of disconnects for our customers, bill assistance for low-income customers, flexible payment arrangements on uh, extended fee relief. Uh, and we've also donated about $2 million uh, to the Illinois COVID-19 response fund. Uh, you know, there's, there's more information on all of those different things on our website. Um, but for the sake of time, uh, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me. And then the last thing I'll, I'll just mention, uh, you know, th throughout these months, we've been looking to collaboratively work with our stakeholders to um, help educate uh, our customers, local businesses, communities, et cetera. And what, one example we have actually tomorrow is we're, we partnered with Cook County um, and are doing a equitable economic recovery, economic development boot camp, essentially, from uh, 3 to 4.30. Uh, and that's going to talk about 
things that include Cook County's Economic Recovery Plan, COVID-19 Response, Illinois' SBA program, and a future economic forecast. And so I'll, I'll throw a link in the chat if anyone's interested in signing up or learning more about that, though. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Great. Thank you so much, Henry. I think that is everyone I saw uh, who had expressed interest in sharing. I want to express uh, gratitude for everyone taking the time to, to share their updates and, and their resources. I think this meeting demonstrates the range of activities and the range of needs that, that we're facing at the moment, that there are uh, so many challenges on so many fronts, and it's, it's really beneficial uh, to, and rewarding to see uh, how many partners CMAP has working on those various issues. Uh, we didn't get to the presentations on the municipal revenue uh, analysis that Lindsay has led or the results of a municipal survey that CMAP uh, did, uh, giving about 60% of our 284 municipalities to share what they were expecting in terms of impacts and, and this effect on services. Uh, but we will be sharing links to those. And, and uh, well, I need to express uh, thanks to my teammates who are willing to give the presentations and I probably owe them uh, baked goods for not being able to get to them today. But this, this conversation sort of demonstrated uh, what we really hoped for in this meeting. I also wanted to mention very briefly that on Thursday, CMAP will be providing a webinar in, uh, well, really providing the platform for a webinar that DCEO and Federal Economic Development Administration, the EDA, uh, will be giving on how communities can take advantage of some of the CARES Act uh, grant programs that are available, uh, particularly the Economic Adjustment Assistance Program and the Public Works Program uh, being offered through EDA. So we will share that in an email later, a link to the register for that webinar and a link in the email later today, as well as all of the links that people have been sharing in the chat box and as well the presentations that we didn't get to today. So unless there are any other uh, questions or comments that people want to share, I think, Jason, you can uh, help us adjourn the meeting. Uh, great, Austin. Uh, thank you to everyone who- Yes, uh, yes it's me, Garland, for public comment. How you great, doing? Garland, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, as you know, for people with disabilities, they don't have enough um, resources, like, you know, especially when when it comes to communicating, especially like um, when they don't have access for the economics, and then also to how, like, um, our organization like Access Living and and then we need to make sure that they could have a transparency to make sure that Access Living and Progress Center for Independent Living in Forest Park will make sure to have transparency because there's not enough resources like for Forest Park Progress Center for Independent Living and not enough for Access Living. So I hope one day um, y'all be able to work on Access Living and Progress Center for Independent Living to make sure to have transparency and make sure up to date what the situation is for individuals with disabilities so we can make sure that everything will be like we'll be keeping up with the keeping up with it because sometimes they just feel like they're out of touch and and don't know where the system is and how they could get involved in it great thank you garland uh any other public comment for anyone else that we were that would like to say anything all right. Um, hearing none, um, I, I posted a link uh, from a really an aggregate of resources uh, that any of you could access through the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, if you have any specific questions on that, happy to talk offline. But that's something that we've just been capturing from across our five states that individuals on this committee, it's broken up by different sector, uh, whether it be nonprofit, government, business community. So, so take a look at that. Um, as far as the calendaring is concerned, we did just receive another cancellation notice for the October 26th meeting, but it looks like those were duplicate meetings. Um, so Austin already has a placeholder uh, on our calendar for October 26th uh, from 9.30 to 11.30. So uh, if there isn't anything else from a committee member, uh, do I have a motion to close? So mm -hmm. Great, uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, participating today. Uh, wish you health and happiness, and uh, our meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye now.